morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome all of you here. Uh, my name is Dennis Burns. I'm a professor at the Kennedy School, and it's a great pleasure for me to welcome uh, Ambassador Neera Palmer Rao, the Indian Ambassador of the United States, to be with us here at Harvard. She has been here over the part of two days. She's been with Professor Shikaba Bose, my colleague from Harvard College, who is here. Uh, and she knows our community because she studied here. Uh, as a Webhead Fellow uh, some years ago, and so it's a homecoming for the ambassador back to the Athens of America in <laughs> uh, this city. Um, you've all uh, seen her biography. She's a very distinguished Indian diplomat, senior Indian diplomat. She served in a variety of very important positions, including it as India's ambassador to the People's Republic of China, and also as foreign secretary, which is the highest career level position in the Indian Foreign Service. She is uh, accompanied here today in part by my very good friend, Ambassador Sam Sham Saran, retired Indian diplomat, who is also a former foreign secretary in India. So we have a wealth of expertise in the room today. Her mission, of course, is to continue to build a strategic partnership between our two countries. I guess I date it from, on the American side, President Clinton's time, and President George W. Bush's time, now President Obama with the added advantage that while we have a bipartisan consensus in the United States among both of our political parties for a very strong relationship with India, that is also true in India uh, between the Congress Party and the BJP and the other parties in the Indian Parliament. And I think we enjoy that stability on both sides of this relationship. We have a strong trade and investment relationship. We have a very strong people-to-people -people relationship. And the ambassador is going to be talking about that this morning. I found when I was Under Secretary of State, a particular strength of this relationship was the Indian American community, their interest in this relationship, and their involvement in it as well, particularly as um, as cultural ambassadors and also as, as 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 the people putting together the trade and investment relationship. In its largest dimensions, this relationship is of geostrategic importance because it's at least my view, but the ambassador, of course, will speak for India, that our two countries have converging strategic interests, particularly in Asia, and that we tend to see the need for peace and stability, uh, and, and especially the prosperity and peace of the democratic powers in Asia to be very much in our common interest. So there are a lot of good things to talk about this morning, and I'm very pleased that Ambassador Rao has accepted our invitation to be here, and I we welcome her to this podium. September 2010, when I was Foreign Secretary and Sudhakar invited me here to deliver the Harish C. Mahindra Memorial Lecture. Not such a long time ago, so it's good to be back so soon. Of course, I come back to Harvard in my new capacity, capacity as ambassador with a sense of nostalgia. I have very pleasant memories of the year I spent here in 1992-93 as fellow at the Center for International Affairs, now the Weatherhead Center. At an earlier stint, when my husband, Sudhakar, was Mason Fellow at the Kennedy School of Government in 1983-1984. It was to Harvard that I came when I came to the United States for the first time, and Harvard became my introduction to America. So this is a connection that I shall always cherish. Of course, Harvard has had a historical connection with India that goes back several decades, in fact, centuries, if I may say. Sanskrit was taught at Harvard as early as, I believe, in 1872. And even before that, in 1847, as my information goes, the Harvard Library had a copy of William Ward's A View of the History, Literature, and Mythology of the Hindus, which was used by Ralph Emerson. 
There was a lively interest about India and things Indian among the Harvard student community. The university has been at the forefront among US universities when it comes to the study of India and its society. Harvard is today not only continuing its tradition of engagement with India, but has strengthened this engagement through its South Asia Initiative and other programs fostering mutual understanding between India and the United States, which is of course central to our partnership. Before I come to the topic assigned to me, I thought it would be good to congratulate Harvard professor and Nobel laureate, India's professor Amartya Sen, who has been awarded the 2011 National Humanities Medal by President Obama for his seminal work in the area of poverty, social justice, development economics, and various facets of human development, all issues that affect people, and as I've always said, people are at the center of any relationship. Therefore, let me say that it is an honor for me to have yet another opportunity to address the Harvard community. I've been here for two days now and had a long string of lectures and interactions which I've greatly enjoyed and benefited from. And today I thought I should speak to you about the qualitative transformation that is taking place in India-US relations. And I would like to just say the theme here is towards common prosperity in a people-driven partnership. I'm often asked the question, what is the central idea that is propelling the India-US strategic partnership forward? One, there are multiple factors that make this relationship so enduring. Our shared values of democracy, respect for individual freedoms and diversity, rule of law, our converging interests on a number of regional and global issues. All of these, I believe, are important, but the foremost among them are our excellent people-to-people -people connections that anchor the partnership and provide vitality and resilience to our relations. And it is this people-centric dimension of our partnership that I'd like to focus on in my remarks today. Links between our scientists, researchers, academics, entrepreneurs, art and culture enthusiasts have always been an important component of such people-to-people -people ties. Indeed, a key element in the relationship between India and the United States has been that it responds to popular aspirations going beyond the calculations of political expediency. It is precisely for this reason that our relations enjoy such wide-ranging support, and Ambassador Burns just referred to it, across the full political spectrum in both our countries. You are well aware of the fact that US universities helped set up institutions of excellence, such as the Indian Institute of Technology in Kanpur and the Indian Institute of Management at Kolkata, institutions which are global brand names now. The United States was an early partner in helping to establish agricultural universities and research institutions in India in the 1960s. The Rockefeller Foundation, for instance, played, played a great role also in just the cementing of ties during our Green Revolution period. It was an American scientist, Nobel laureate, Norman Borlaug, who developed high-yielding varieties of wheat in Mexico, which were then adapted to Indian conditions in the institutions that US scientists helped establish. This was the beginning of the Green Revolution in India. Today, we work together to help realize an evergreen revolution to improve agricultural productivity in India. The Fulbright program, established in 1950, has provided opportunities for more than 16,000 scholars, both from India and the United States, to visit and to pursue research and study in each other's countries and has enhanced mutual understanding. This program was renewed in 2008 as the Nehru Fulbright Program, and reflecting India's increasing capabilities, was turned into a partnership with both India and the US 
becoming equal partners and contributing to substantially expand the program to provide more student and scholar exchange grants in priority fields such as science, technology, and agriculture. About 300 students and scholars visit each country annually under this flagship program. And of course, there is the US Peace Corps, which sent its volunteers to India till 1976 and helped promote people-to-people -people linkages. More than 4,000 American volunteers spent time in India working mostly in rural communities from the Peace Corps. Last year, the embassy had partnered with such volunteers to celebrate their 50th reunion. The overwhelming sentiment of the volunteers was how their stay in India had changed their lives and created lasting bonds of friendship with ordinary Indians, bonds which have endured and still thrive. I've visited during the last five months that I've been in the United States, a number of academic institutions and universities in different parts of the country. And wherever I go, I find tremendous interest in establishing collaborative ventures with Indian institutions. There are Indian study centers and initiatives at universities such as Harvard, of course, Pennsylvania, Yale, Michigan, Columbia, Duke, and the list is continuously growing. The linkages with Indian institutions through the US study abroad program, such as those run by Emory University, Lewis and Clark College at the University of Iowa, allow US students to explore contemporary India. The Singh Obama 21st Century Knowledge Initiative announced in 2009 is strengthening teaching and research in both US and Indian institutions through university linkages and junior faculty development, including greater emphasis on community colleges. The United States remains a preferred destination for Indian students to pursue their advanced college degrees. Nearly 100,000 students from India are benefiting from the higher education system in the United States, and I believe also contributing value to that system. And we would like to see more and more American students coming to India in the future to study in India. The newly launched Passport to India initiative by the United States State Department is a laudable initiative in this direction. And I believe as the economic engagement between India and the United States grows further, we would see continuous expansion in such exchanges between India and the United States unleashing the creative energy of our youth for common prosperity. In October last year, we hosted the first ever India-US Higher Education Summit in Washington, DC, which has defined a strategic vision for the future of the US-India Higher Education Partnership. As both our countries work towards becoming truly knowledge economies, I believe there are immense opportunities for forging new links in the areas of education, research, and innovation, as also technology and skill development. At the popular level, there is a tremendous interest and goodwill that Indian culture enjoys in the United States, and I've sensed this wherever I've gone in my five months here. This was evident when we hosted the Maximum India Festival last year in Washington, D.C. Our American friends were able to see and experience the rich tapestry of art and cultural heritage from different parts of India under one roof. To sustain this spirit of inquiry about India among our American friends, we hope at the Embassy of India to establish an Indian cultural center in Washington, D.C. soon, which would provide, as I see it, a platform for the exchange of ideas and intellectual discourse between our two peoples in the coming years. Another critical area of our bilateral cooperation is in science and technology, which is impacting the lives of our peoples in a significant manner. In recent years, our scientific cooperation has taken a new dimension to advance common goals in science, in research and development, supporting partnerships between public and private research institutions and industry, 
to meet pressing global problems such as environmental and biodiversity protection, safe drinking water, clean energy, climate change, finding cures for HIV, AIDS, and other infectious and chronic diseases. With the setting up of the Bilateral Science and Technology Endowment Fund of 30 million US dollars, we are capitalizing on our respective scientific and technological strengths to encourage promising and innovative ideas and creating an SMT ecosystem that could produce material benefits for both our countries and support the vibrant entrepreneurial spirit in India and the United States. We have also, in yet another sign of mutual confidence, overcome concerns of the past on India's space program and have made a promising beginning for a new era of cooperation. And the stellar role that the Indian-American diaspora has been playing in deepening people-to-people -people linkages cannot be underestimated. They have created jobs and prosperity in this country and participated in the development of cutting edge and frontier technologies that have helped improve the lives of people. For instance, Indian American scientists have contributed to the Indian pharmaceutical sector, including production of affordable hepatitis vaccine in India and completing the genome sequencing of Indian isolate of hep hepatitis C virus that causes chronic hepatitis. They are also collaborating in, in establishing a neutrino observatory in India. Our scientists, both, to both our countries, are now collaborating to enhance our ability to forecast the monsoon through the establishment of a monsoon desk at NOAA, which will ultimately help millions of farmers across India to improve their productivity and raise incomes. Yet another central and crucial driver of our relations is our growing economic partnership. A number of US firms are capitalizing on the large pool of skilled engineers, scientists, and researchers in India. A number of US companies have research centers in cities like Bangalore. Together, they are producing innovative and affordable solutions in diverse fields, such as healthcare and energy. The steady growth of the Indian economy has not only helped improve the living standards of our people, but has also opened up new opportunities to expand our mutually beneficial economic and commercial ties with the United States. Two-way trade in goods and services continues to grow steadily, reaching over 100 billion US dollars last year. The US businesses are becoming strong partners in India's economic growth story, and Indian businesses are creating value, wealth, and jobs in the United States. Indian companies are now contributing to local state economies in the United States with a presence in 43 US states, states in the US and having invested over US dollars 26 billion in the last five years in several key areas of the economy in manufacturing as also in services. India's IT industry has been in particular a strong player in establishing value-based, mutually beneficial partnerships. As per our estimates, Indian IT companies employ over 100,000 people in the US, and the Indian IT industry supports over 280,000 jobs indirectly, out of which 200,000 jobs are with US residents. In order to continue on the high growth trajectory, <laughs> India will need to invest more than $1 trillion in the coming years in building a world-class infrastructure that could cater to the demands of the billion-plus population and ensure the availability of clean sources of energy, including nuclear energy, to fuel such growth. In both these areas, we are working with the US to build mutually beneficial ties. Because Indo-US economic ties have been knowledge, technology, and people intensive, they have had a profound impact on the relationship that goes beyond the business sector. A vital input to achieving the ambitious <coughs> growth targets that we have set for ourselves would be energy. And increasingly, it will have to come from clean sources. 
We are working together with the U.S. across a full portfolio of clean energy options. The U.S. is assisting us in mapping our reserves of shale gas resources. The Civil Nuclear Initiative has become a symbol of our transformed relationship and was welcomed by people from both sides in both countries and in which, of course, Ambassador Burns played such an important role and Ambassador Shamsaran, who is here with us this morning. And all this grew out of our conviction that nuclear energy could help us meet our energy requirements in an environmentally sustainable manner. There are immense opportunities for US companies in this sector, may I emphasize. And Indian and US companies are, in fact, already engaged in discussions to take this cooperation forward. On its part, the government of India, let me assure you, is committed to providing a level playing field for all our international partners, including our American friends. Taken together, it is evident that people-to-people -people contact remains at the heart of the India-US relationship. Backed by this extraordinary connectivity at the people level, both sides are expanding their strategic and political consultations on issues of mutual interest and responding to new geopolitical and geostrategic realities. As we work to enhancing our mutual prosperity, there is also an increasing level of cooperation between our countries to ensure peace and security, both in the regional context and in the wider global context. All of us are familiar with the challenges that our two countries face, global economic stress, profound geopolitical changes, especially in Asia, as also regional instability and the continuing threat of terrorism in South Asia. Whether it is terrorism or the challenge of maintaining peace amidst fast-paced changes in the Asia-Pacific, our interests increasingly converge. Our understanding of the nature and the source of problems that we face is much in our cooperation in the field of security has broken new ground and explored new ideas and concepts. Our militaries, once unfamiliar with each other, now hold regular dialogue and joint exercises in the air and on land and sea. We coordinate anti-piracy efforts and have worked together on humanitarian missions. Our defense trade, which was negligible until a decade ago, has grown and today we have placed orders worth 8 billion US dollars on US defense equipment producers, and this is bound to grow even more in the future as India looks to modernize our armed forces. Our counterterrorism cooperation has acquired new momentum and depth, even as India continues to take steps to improve our domestic capabilities to counter this threat. In Afghanistan, we are not only engaged in our individual assistance efforts, but are now working together in areas such as capacity building, agriculture, and women's empowerment. Both our countries understand the imperative of ensuring success in Afghanistan. While successful transition of security in Afghanistan in 2014 is important, that alone cannot guarantee long-term stability in the region. This would require building of Afghan institutions, capacities, and more importantly, the elimination of safe havens and infrastructure for terrorism and violent extremism in Afghanistan and Pakistan, a goal that both our countries share in common. India has invested significant resources for Afghanistan's development in priority areas identified by Afghanistan. With its growing economy and expanding markets, India can and is willing to partner with other countries and play the role of an anchor for long-term prosperity and stability of the region. In the broader regional context, I refer to the ongoing changes in the Asia-Pacific region, there is today a much greater awareness between our two countries of our Asian-Pacific identities, or if I may say, our Indo-Pacific identities. The region is undergoing rapid change and throwing up new challenges. India has always been conscious of her Asian identity and of our location at the strategic and cultural crossroads of Asia. The future of the Asian Pacific region is of vital importance to India's own future. 
The US, I know, also regards the region as one of special strategic focus. The safety of the sea lanes of communication in the Indian Ocean is vital for economic growth, not just for India and for the US, but for the entire region. Maritime trade routes in the Indian Ocean are vital for international commerce and global energy security, and we have a common interest in combating threats such as piracy. <coughs> Therefore, we have agreed to enhance our maritime security cooperation. For instance, we're working together with the US and the international community to combat piracy in the Gulf of Aden and off the coast of Somalia. India and the US have been described as natural strategic partners. Today, our strategic partnership has global significance. The expanding cooperation between India and the US remains firmly anchored in our shared values and our ability to work together in a variety of fields from fighting the menace of terrorism to ensuring the stability of the global economy. The India-US strategic dialogue initiated in 2009 has identified five principal areas for expanding cooperation. Strategic <coughs> cooperation, energy and climate change, education and development, economy, trade and agriculture, science and technology, health and innovation. The third meeting of the dialogue will be held later this year. Our leaders have laid out a strategic vision for one of the defining partnerships of the 21st century. Our task is to advance this partnership and to impart it with further meaning and substance. I see a future full of hope, promise, and opportunity for deepening our strategic partnership, guided by our long-term objectives and shared ideals of democratic functioning in order to meet the important challenges of our times and to advance peace and prosperity in our increasingly interdependent and interconnected world. And in consolidating this important enterprise, the Indian and the American people have a leading role. With these words, I'd be happy to take your questions.